All right, let's pick up and talk about how we can have energy movement throughout our ecosystem. We find as we have energy going from one part of the ecosystem to another part of the ecosystem that we can diagram that with a food web. This food web simply says who eats who or whom eats whom. A food web can be thought of as many interconnected food chains. We're going to have the grazing food web and detro food webs. And these are two subcategories of food webs that will show us um, the producers and also show us the decomposers as well. Regardless of where an organism is on the food web, it's going to have a specific level. And that level, either between producer and herbivore or carnivore, or between herbivore and primary carnivore or secondary carnivore, is going to be known as a trophic level. Generally speaking, the farther down on the food chain, or the closer that organism is to the producer level, the farther down or the lower its trophic level is. If that organism is eaten by many different other organisms, it's going to be at the bottom or have a low trophic level. If that organism is not consumed by other organisms or consumed by few organisms, it'll be higher up on the trophic level. So we as human beings do not have many natural predators. So we're pretty high up on the trophic level um, count for our food webs. As we look at our trophic levels at the bottom, we have producers, so think of plants. Then we have the primary consumers. Our primary consumers are herbivores. Secondary consumers are going to be our, our low-level predators. So when I think of a primary consumer, think of a mouse. A secondary consumer could be a snake that eats the mouse, and then we can even have a tertiary consumer, and that tertiary consumer would be the eagle that eats the snake. And depending on how complicated you make your food web, you can even have a quadrinary or a fourth level added onto it. As we have our energy flow from one level to the next trophic level, we're going to have an energy loss, approximately 90% energy loss from one trophic level to the next trophic level. In other words, we have approximately 10% of the energy consumed retained within a trophic level. So if you ate 100 calories, or excuse me, 100 joules worth of food, and you're, of that 100 joules of food that you ate, only 10 joules of energy would be incorporated into your body. Most of the energy is going to be lost as waste products or waste heat. Here's an excellent example of a food web. And this food web is going to show both grazers and the ditro level as well. So we'll have decomposers down here at the bottom. And then these decomposers are going to add to the inorganic nutrient pool which is used by the producers to feed the herbivores. And then those herbivores are then going to feed the consumers. As we look at energy flow throughout the food pyramid, we find that most energy is going to be at that producer level. So if we look at how much energy is contained in a lake within the plants of the lake, there's a lot of energy. And then if we look at the herbivores that eat those plants, there's less energy. And then as we keep going to secondary carnivores and then tertiary, we're going to have less and less energy contained in that trophic level. So, guys, gals, concept check question. If we have a thousand units of energy at the bottom trophic level of a food web, how many units of energy would be two levels higher? We have one, ten, one hundred, one thousand, or ten thousand. If only ten percent of the energy can be transferred from one level, to the next level, and we started with a thousand units, how much energy would we have left after 
two levels transfer. So what's 10% of 1,000? It is B. Very good. 10% of 1,000 is 100. And then 10% of 100 is 10. So we've cut it at, we've reduced it ten, by 10% or by 90% twice. And we've been left with B as our final answer. Are you f able to follow, Ashley? Oh, okay. Your brain is Swiss cheese. I get it. <laughs> Let's spend some time talking about biogeochemical cycles as well. This is the inorganic nutrient cycling that occurs. These nutrients are going to circulate between biotic and abiotic factors within our ecosystem. And we're going to have reservoirs. These reservoirs, generally speaking, are going to be long-term storage. These reservoirs don't have high turnovers or rates of turnover for these nutrients. So if we look at fossil fuels, those could be a reservoir for carbon. We can have rocks and sediments being a mineral for sulfur or phosphorus. And if we look at our atmosphere, it's a reservoir for nitrogen. And then we're going to have exchange pools. These exchange pools are going to have rapid cycling of nutrients. And these exchange pools, depending on the nutrient, are going to either be water, they could be the atmosphere, or they could be surface soil. So to summarize a basic biogeochemical cycle, we're going to have nutrients from a reservoir made available and put into the exchange pool by either human activities or by animal activities. And then from the exchange pool, those nutrients can be put back into long-term storage through inorganic and organic processes. Let's talk about the water cycle, the single most important cycle on our planet. Our water cycle is going to be involved with taking water from our exchange pools to our storage pools. We find that we can take water from the liquid form and evaporate it up into the atmosphere. And from th there, it can then precipitate back down to the Earth. So we'll have evaporation from the ocean. We can have evaporation from the land. And if there was a glacier shown here, I could also show you sublimation. So from here, we'll use this body of ice. They could have water go from a solid to a gas directly. That's sublimation, when you skip the liquid stage. Whenever a food product is freeze-dried, it's sublimated to freeze it and then remove the water from it. After that water evaporates or makes it into the atmosphere, it then precipitates. It rains back down. And as it precipitates, either it can rain back down into the ocean it can rain down onto the land. If it rains down on the land, it may be reabsorbed and filtered through the rocks to be stored in an aquifer, or it can run off back into the ocean. And this process is going to continually cycle water on our planet. We as human beings interfere with the water cycle all the time. We can drill wells to tap the aquifer and remove water from the aquifer. And that's been great for us as human beings to have a reliable source of fresh water. The downside is that we've, generally speaking, particularly in developing countries, overuse the aquifers. We withdraw too much water from those aquifers, and they aren't being replenished quickly enough. We are also clearing vegetation from land. This is going to increase the amount of runoff um, I know in La Crosse, Wisconsin, for example, there are a lot of city ordinances right now aimed to decrease runoff, to combat all the increase in runoff. Um, so if a new parking lot is built in La Crosse, Wisconsin, it needs to have permeable pavement put in that allows the rainwater to be absorbed through the asphalt and retained in a gravel bed underneath the pavement, or there needs to be a water retaining pond built in to that parking pad in the corner so that the water can then be absorbed into the ground as opposed to clogging up the storm drain system. 
here in the city of Red Wing right now, we're in the process of incrementally a couple city blocks a year separating the sewer system from the storm drain system. And as those are being separated from each other, that would allow for us to still effectively treat the sewage before dumping sewage in the Mississippi River, but then also allowing for rainwater to just quickly and rapidly flush into the Mississippi River. While they were connected to each other, whenever there was a massive rainstorm, that massive rainstorm would overload the sewage treatment plant and cause raw sewage to be dumped into the Mississippi River. Our next cycle is the carbon cycle. And this is going to involve the cycling of carbon dioxide through various forms. It'll go from the atmosphere to plants to organisms and then to bedrock and back and forth again. We can find that our producers, our plants, will take carbon dioxide in through the process of photosynthesis and take it from, a biotic, or from an abiotic to a biotic form. And then we as consumers will eat the plants and then go through cellular respiration and then make our ATP. And as a byproduct of making the ATP, we exhale carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere. We can also take a tree, for example, which will have many hundreds or thousands of pounds of carbon dioxide stored up in it, and we can chop that tree down and turn it into firewood and burn it. Or something that we've been doing relatively recently as human beings is we've been digging up reserves of carbon dioxide. We've been digging up fossil fuels, burning those fossil fuels, and then adding that carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. So carbon dioxide can get into the atmosphere from cellular respiration, and that's from an organism eating another organism and making ATP. Carbon dioxide gets into the atmosphere because we cut trees down and burn them. It gets into the atmosphere because we collect fossil fuels and burn those fossil fuels. And carbon dioxide can get into the atmosphere from decay, as we have cellular decay occurring. So there's many different ways for carbon dioxide to get into the atmosphere. We can also lose carbon dioxide from the atmosphere as well. We can take carbon dioxide and dissolve it in the ocean. And as carbon dioxide is dissolved in the ocean, it's turned into carbonic acid, and then from carbonic acid to bicarbonate ions. This is one of the things that's going on right now as the, the atmospheric carbon dioxide levels have been going up, up, up lately um, over the last several decades. Just this year, we passed 400 parts per carbon for the first time ever. We find that as there's more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, there's more bicarbonate and carbonic acid in the ocean. And the ocean is becoming increasingly acidic. That bicarbonate in the ocean can then be turned into limestone and sediment and then stored for long periods of time in the bottom of the ocean. Or that bicarbonate can turn back into carbon dioxide and exit the ocean. It can bubble out of the ocean. We can also remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere through photosynthesis. That's how most carbon dioxide is removed from the atmosphere. Occasionally, we will then take carbon dioxide that was added to a, a, bi or a biotic source, some living organism. And if we take that tree or that animal and bury it, the carbon dioxide that was in it is then going to be stuck underground. So we as human beings have been adding lots of reserve carbon dioxide to the atmosphere by burning fossil fuels. There are some other gases as well, such as N2O and CH4, which are also being emitted to human gases or to the atmosphere due to human activities. These other two gases, in addition to carbon dioxide, are known as greenhouse gases. These are gases that cause ultraviolet radiation, excuse me, that cause infrared radiation to be retained within the Earth. In other words, they trap heat in our atmosphere and cause the overall warming of our planet. Another term that's being used for global warming um, is climate change because there are selective areas in the world as there are changes in the atmosphere patterns associated with this increased amount of heat energy where we actually have localized cooling in particular areas on our planet. Over the next several dec decades and centuries, um, current climate models predict 
that most of the United States is going to be warmer and will continue to warm. And then a couple regions of the United States, or some very small localized regions, will actually become slightly cooler. They'll just keep melting. Glaciers are going to continue to melt. Right now on our planet, um, to my knowledge, every single glacier on the planet is getting smaller annually. Back in the mid-90s when I first checked on it, I wanted to say that there was still a glacier or two that wasn't shrinking. But as of earlier this year when I checked, every glacier on the planet is shrinking. So you should also visit Glacier National Park if you still want to see a glacier sooner rather than later. Let's move on and talk about the nitrogen cycle. Our nitrogen cycle involves the movement of nitrogen from the biotic to abiotic sources. The primary reserve of nitrogen on our planet is the Earth's atmosphere. N2 gas is unbelievably inert. That is one nitrogen atom triple bonded, triple covalently bonded to another nitrogen atom. And that triple covalent bond is incredibly stable. N2 gas is almost as chemically inert as noble gases like helium or argon. And most of our atmosphere is made of this unusable inert nitrogen gas. And there are a couple ways we can take this unusable nitrogen and turn it into a usable form. One of which is lightning bolts. We need a ton of energy to rip apart that triple carbon bond. And lightning bolts just happen to have enough energy to do that. Another way we can rip apart that triple carbon bond is to lower the energy of activation or the activation energy required to proceed with that chemical reaction. And we can lower that activation energy through enzymatic action in nitrogen fixing bacteria. And those nitrogen fixing bacteria will use enzymes that make it much energetically easier to rip apart N2 and then combine it with hydrogens to make ammonia. This has also been known as the Born-Haber process. And if you're into chemistry and World War II history, that's a very interesting process that was used by Germany to have an unlimited source of gunpowder. But we're here to talk about human interactions with the environment and the biome as a whole. So after those nitrogen-fixing bacteria take nitrogen gas and convert it into ammonium, then we can have nitrifying bacteria. And these nitrifying bacteria will take ammonium and convert it into nitrate, or an NO3 with a minus one charge. And nitrates and ammoniums are biologically available forms of nitrogen. These forms of nitrogen can be used by plants to enter into the biome. We also have some bacteria that take this NH4 and this NH3 and convert it back to N2. These are called denitrifying bacteria. And these denitrifying bacteria balance out the activities of the nitrogen fixing and nitrifying bacteria. If we did not have the denitrifying bacteria, our atmosphere would have less and less nitrogen gas in it every single year. But because we have these denitrifying bacteria, they balance out the overall transfer of nitrogen. So for, a, um, for the amount of nitrogen we take out of the atmosphere, we add that much N2 gas back to the atmosphere. Our nitrogen cycle becomes rather complex. There's lots of extra cycling involved. Ultimately, we have the N2 gas in the atmosphere. And we can have a separate community or cycle of bacteria of nitrogen cycling in the ocean that I alluded to earlier. We can also have a separate cycle of nitrogen cycling in the soil as we alternate between ammonia, nitrite, and nitrate forms of nitrogen. And then we can add nitrogen from the atmosphere. My favorite is, of course, is lightning to fix nitrogen. We can also use nitrifying bacteria as well to take nitrogen from the atmosphere and dump that into the biome to make it biologically available. If we artificially increase the amount of nitrogen in a body of water, 
that's going to be a process known as eutrophication. And if we have eutrophication occur, we're going to have a dramatic increase in nitrogen. That dramatic increase in nitrogen means that there will be an algae bloom. And the algae bloom itself isn't necessarily that bad. It's what happens next. After the algae bloom dies, they decompose. And as that algae is decomposing, the decomposers suck oxygen out of the water, and that causes fish to asphyxiate. Or as that algae bloom is decomposing and the oxygen is being sucked out of the water, we'll have major fish kills. Something else that's been adding or changing the balance of nitrogen in our planet is the burning of fossil fuels. As we burn fossil fuels, we can take nitrogen oxides and add them into the atmosphere. Another gas associated with the burning of fossil fuels is sulfur oxides or sulfur dioxide. And when we add these two gases with the atmosphere, they combine with water within the atmosphere to form nitric acid and sulfuric acid two of the primary components of acid rain. Now, it's worth emphasizing all rain is acidic because all rain has carbon dioxide converted to carbonic acid within the atmosphere. So even before the burning of fossil fuels, carbonic acid in rainwater meant that all rainwater was acidic. However, the addition of the nitrogen oxides and the sulfur dioxide now means that we have even more acidic rain. And when we refer to acid rain in general, this is rain water that is especially acidic from the nitric acid and the sulfuric acid that's produced as a fossil fuel byproduct. Questions? All right. Now, in a perfect world, we'll have lots of warm air near the surface. And that warm air near the surface will be less dense and it'll rise up, 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 up. And as that warm air rises up, it carries with it some of the pollution associated with fossil fuel combustion and dilutes it in the upper atmosphere. Every once in a while, though, if a city is located within a valley, we can have a band of cool air sandwiched between two bands of cold air. Think of Los Angeles, for example, in the Los Angeles Valley. And whenever we had this inversion occur, the pollution produced by that city rises up, 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 and then goes back down again. It starts to build up and congregate around the city, forming smog. Most smog is formed from N2 and NO gases. Excuse me, N, N2O and NO gases. And those are responsible, particularly the NO gas, is responsible for the orangish-brown haze that you see in smog. I'll never forget when I was a freshman in general chemistry in college, we had a reaction where we actually made NO gas in the lab. And like a little idiot, I didn't follow the safety directions, and I wafted the NO gas into my nose and breathed it in, and it burned like a son of a gun because that NO gas immediately turned to nitric acid when combined with the moisture of my respiratory tract. And I had a very unpleasant evening as part of my respiratory tract was digested by nitric acid. So follow the safety instructions. It's very important. As that nitric acid and sulfuric acid has been artificially increasing the acidity of the rain, I do not know if it's from Pompeii specifically. But we found that limestone and marble-based statues and buildings have had an increased amount of erosion because those are minerals that dissolve in acids. Large swaths of forests have been killed off because of the acidification of the soil. And this is all linked back to the increased amount of sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxide gas being added to the atmosphere from fossil fuel combustion. Let's talk the phosphorus cycle. As we look at our phosphorus cycle, we are going to cycle phosphorus from inorganic to organic forms. 
Our phosphate ion that's most available in the organic form is going to be PO4. This is organically available phosphorus or a phosphate ion. And this phosphate ion will be stored long-term as a rock. And then we can mine that rock and use it to make fertilizer. And then that fertilizer is added to the biotic community and could potentially cause runoff into aquatic ecosystems. In many aquatic ecosystems, or for many producers in general, phosphorus is a limiting nutrient. And when I say limiting nutrient, I mean that phosphorus is going to help to limit the amount of plant growth. And if we have an increase in phosphorus, we're going to have an increase in plant growth. So if we look at a, a body of water, if we add lots of nitrogen, or if we add lots of phosphorus, we can cause algal blooms that would then result in lots of algae being decomposed and then fish dying off. So fertilizer and sewage discharge and runoff are the primary sources of phosphorus pollution. Something that's worth emphasizing is that most fertilizer runoff occurs from small homeowners over applying fertilizer to their lawns. Um, for agricultural purposes, before you can apply phosphorus to, or phosphorus fertilizers to your field, you need to go through a training regimen to help you do the calculations to have the proper dosages of phosphorus. And that's for two reasons. One, it's to maximize your profits. Profits, because if you dump extra fertilizer on your field, eventually you get to the point where that fertilizer is not going to be absorbed, and you're just wasting money. And then secondly, it's for an environmental purpose. Um, the governments of our world don't want us to over-apply fertilizer to the field because that results in eutrophication of our bodies of water. However, most small homeowners don't go through the training courses and don't have the financial incentives to minimize and apply appropriate doses of fertilizer. And instead, most small homeowners or homeowners take a more is better approach and I want a really green lawn, so I'm going to apply lots and lots of fertilizer to my lawn. Even though the vast majority of that fertilizer is just going to run off into the storm sewage drains. There are different sources of pollution. We could have point source and non-point sources of pollution. A point source is going to typically be associated with an opening of a pipe. It's a very specific location that's very easy to identify. Our non-point sources of pollution are going to be over wide areas of land. They're hard to pin down from one to one specific location. Good examples of non-point sort solution would include anything associated with runoff and not an opening of a pipe. As we're cycling nutrients in our ecosystems, one nutrient that we've been, that we've been introducing at exponentially larger rates is mercury. Most mercury is not biologically available or biologically active. Mercury has not been added to our planet or subtracted to the planet. The amount of mercury that was on our planet hasn't changed dramatically in the last 200 years. But what has changed is the form that mercury is taking. It's gone from a biologically unavailable form to now biologically available. And to make that mercury biologically available, we typically are going to burn coal power or burn coal at a power plant. And as we burn that coal, at a power plant, we will then evaporate the mercury and put it into the atmosphere as gaseous mercury. That gaseous mercury is then going to end up in our bodies of water and becomes methylated by bacteria. And once we have a methylated mercury atom, so there's HG for mercury with a methyl group attached to it, that methylated mercury is biologically very potent. It's taken into our bodies and accumulates in our body. As a heavy metal, it's preferentially going to accumulate in the fatty tissues of our bodies and the compact bone tissue of our bodies. And because it can stay in our bodies for a very long period of time, it's going to bioaccumulate. 
And as we eat the organisms that make up our food sources, we can then retain all the mercury from those organisms in our bodies. So if we go back to the food pyramid, or the food, since there are lots and lots of producers, the mercury is diluted among many different organisms. But the farther we go up on the food pyramid, the fewer and fewer organisms there are to dilute the mercury, and mercury becomes much more concentrated. So if we look at the high trophic levels in the food web, organisms at that high or the trophic level or at the top of the food chain, generally speaking, have very high concentrations of mercury in their bodies. This is one of the reasons why you'll find warnings in lakes here in Minnesota against eating walleye or northern pike. But you can eat panfish from the lake. Panfish are lower down, they're at a lower trophic level, and don't accumulate as much mercury as those apex predators in the lakes. So here are some classic sources of water pollution in our, in our environment from human sources. We can have heat from a power plant and we can have excess warm water being dumped into the ecosystem. We can have an oil spill. We can have fertilizer runoff and nutrients from a treatment plant or a suburban development all contribute to the eutrophication of our waterways. We can have biomedical wastes adding pharmacology, um, antibiotics and hormones to the water. A large city is going to have a lot of increased runoff associated with it because those large cities have industry and also don't have a lot of soil, exposed soil, that can absorb rainwater. If we look at barnyards, particularly where there's lots of cattle in a concentrated area, there'll be an increased amount of runoff at that area because cattle preferentially are going to walk around and destroy the plants and end up with an increased amount of runoff from sedimentation as they kill the plants in their barnyard. And they also have a lot of fecal matter or poop concentrated in one specific area. So I have a question for you guys. Please identify each below as a point source. We'll say PS for point source or NPS for non-point source of pollution. So would lawn runoff be a point source or non-point source? We have an NPS and then Alyssa, how about a fertilized field? PS? So point source, Ashley, what would you say about a sewage treatment plant's drainage pipe? Um, so point source, and then Alyssa, factory chimneys? <laughs> point source. The rule of thumb is if it's associated with a pipe, it's a point source. If it's associated with runoff, it is a non-point source. So if it's really easy to localize, it's point source. So we did a great job. We got three out of four correct as a class. Fertilized fields are non-point sources. And that's all we have for chapter, or for this recording. Let me double check to make sure we covered everything. Yes, we covered the entire chapter. So we are all done with our chapters recording. If you have any questions, swing by my office when you're on campus.